Thanks for joining us for our Proverbs series. We are in Proverbs chapter 18, and how appropriate this particular chapter is for what we are currently going through here in the United States and, of course, across the world with the COVID-19 virus. Very interesting times. Uh, But I think Proverbs chapter 18, particularly in the beginning, speaks forthrightly to us to really communicate to us uh, how we need to view these particular times where we sometimes might be inclined to disassociate with the people of God. We, by nature, are social creatures. It's not wise, uh, just even from a naturalistic perspective, to avoid people because we learn so much from them, Uh, certainly in the scientific world, in the mathematical world, in the musical world, in the medical world. We learn from each other, and these things are very important. But so much more for those of us who are believers in Christ. The issue of fellowship and spending time together is significant in the Bible. It must not be dismissed. And there's a movement in Uh, and among those who call themselves preterists, preterism, those who believe in fulfilled eschatology or that redemption has been completely fulfilled, there's a movement that exists where we don't give high regard to fellowship. And it's very, very unhealthy. I don't recommend it at all. And when you run across these types of people who feel like they can just sit behind their computer screens and be content with that kind of fellowship, um, that is dangerous. It is just flat out dangerous, and I think we're going to see that from the scriptures. So I hope that you would be encouraged from this. Don't be discouraged from watching this particular PowerPoint as we make our way through this wonderful chapter. We're going to focus on the first uh, first verse, but really we're going to read through it and eventually get through it in, in parts two and probably part three and four. But I want to focus on the first part of the chapter today. So What we're going to do is we're going to look at the text initially, which is Proverbs 18. And then after that, we will look at the context. And that will involve various chapters or verses in Proverbs. And certainly we will also look at the intertext, which involves the rest of Scripture. Uh, We'll see a lot of passages today in Psalms and from the New Testament that are included in that intertext. But let's look at Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 through 24. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. A fool does not delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own mind. When a wicked man comes, contempt also comes, and with dishonor comes reproach. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The fountain of wisdom is a bubbling brook. To show partiality to the wicked is not good, nor to thrust aside the righteous in judgment. A fool's lips bring strife, but his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a whisperer, are like dainty morsels, and they go down into the innermost parts of the body. He also, who is slack in his work, is brother to him who destroys. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his own imagination. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty but humility goes before honor. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. The spirit of a man can endure sickness, but a broken spirit who can bear. The mind of the prudent acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. The first to plead his case seems just until another comes and examines him. The lot puts an end to contentions and decides between the mighty. A brother offended is harder to be one than a strong city, 
and contentions are like the bars of a castle. With the fruits of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. The poor man utters supplications, but the rich man answers roughly. A man of many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Again, that's Proverbs 18, verses 1 through 24. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the first verse. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom. Well, let's take a look at this in comparison to some passages in Proverbs. What does it mean to separate? We all know that we've had times in our own lives where we feel like the world is against us. Couples sometimes do this when they first meet each other and there's butterflies and infatuation and maybe people on the outside are saying, it doesn't seem wise, it looks like you're going too fast. And they're like, no, 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 we know what is right. You don't. We feel this in our spirit. Well, sometimes we as individuals can do this too. I did this for a time around 2004 to 2007 where I became very cynical of the body of Christ, cynical of the church. Now, none of us has all the right answers and none of us is, is flawless in the way that we interpret scripture. And certainly none of us is flawless when it comes to morality. And we can judge people. We can look at people and their performance or lack thereof and make a judgment and decide, well, I'm not going to hang around them or I'm not going to hang around that particular body of believers or I'm not going to fellowship anymore. I'm just going to read the Bible on my own. Well, what does the Bible have to say about that kind of spirit? It's especially tempting for those of us who really do desire to study the scriptures and we see so much, uh, so much false teaching coming from pulpits and we listen to it and we see fear and guilt manipulation happening and it's just a real drag. It can be very discouraging for those of us who see such wonderful things in the scripture and these beautiful truths about who Jesus is, that he's Lord, that he is God, that he rose from the dead, that he finished the work of his, his own sacrifice for sin and removing sin. And we see things that contradict that. And it's very discouraging. But if we make that move to just isolate ourselves from the body of Christ, we have disregarded scripture and disregarded the body of of Christ and Christ himself. So let's take a look at the scriptures. Proverbs 18 verse 1. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against sound wisdom. You're fighting wisdom when you separate yourself. We fight wisdom. Well, where do we find some of this wisdom? Look at Proverbs 11 verse 14. Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors there is victory. Now the context here is counselors who are believers. It has nothing to do with seeking secular counsel in this area of fellowship. This is speaking about fellowship and doctrinal guidance, practical doctrinal guidance from the Word of God. For those people who feel like doctrine is unimportant, I just encourage you to read First and Second Timothy and Titus. And in those three books, which are books that are written to elders, the word doctrine, didaskos, is mentioned about 32 or 33 times. Doctrine is important. Sound teaching accompanied with practice. Where there is no guidance, the people fall. In the guidance, is obviously associated with the people of God, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Now, we mustn't take this to the extreme like uh, the Roman Catholic Church has done and put its trust in extra biblical creeds, such as the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed or what the Reformers do with the Westminster Confession or Baptists with the London Baptist Confession. We mustn't put our trust in creeds. And both the Reformers and the Catholics have done this in their trust in the creeds, in their trust in the confessions. We must place our trust in the scriptures and those who have devoted their hearts to the scriptures. That's super important for all of us to follow. 
Don't just put your trust in yourself as an individual. Put your trust in the Spirit of God working through the Scriptures and through His people. That's why we need this sharp iron sharpening iron. I'm always open for people to come against anything that I am teaching that may be false or contradicts Scripture. I want to be rebuked. I need to be rebuked when I am coming against the Scripture. We all do. We all need to humbly submit to what the Scripture says. So where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is what? Victory. There is victory. Without consultation, Proverbs 15, verse 22, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. For by wise guidance, you will wage war, and in abundance of counselors, there is victory. There it is again. We wage a war, and we're waging a war with the body of Christ, not against flesh and blood, but as Paul says, against principalities and powers, that is, the spirits of people. Those are spirits in heavenly places. We're in heavenly places. That is our mind. That is the heavenly places in which Christ dwells. But others also are dwelling in heavenly places, but their minds, their heavenly places are darkened. We need to understand this. Well, now we move to Psalms. How do we know that it was important to them? And these are actually prophetic psalms, speaking of the Messianic kingdom, but it was important to them. They were the congregation of Israel. It was the congregation. We use the word church today, but sometimes we'll use the word congregation as well. The congregation or the tabernacle or the sanctuary or the temple or the church, they're all synonymous today. It is the body of believers, whether it's a house church or a mega church. It's wherever believers are gathered. So what did the psalmist say? I will give you thanks in the great congregation. So it's not just a matter of giving thanks to God privately in your closet. That's important. Jesus encouraged us in our prayer closets. But we are also to go to the great congregation. Now, prim primarily speaking, this is probably Christ saying, I will give you, Father, thanks in the great congregation. We see this in Hebrews chapter 1 and 2, where Christ sings in the midst of the congregation. It's a beautiful thing. But I will praise you among a mighty throng. So this is a regular practice of the believer, Psalm 35, verse 18. In Psalm 40, verse 9, I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great Congregation, this is the kingdom message, the glad tidings of Isaiah chapter chapter 40 and, and 52. This is the good news. How beautiful are the feet of them who bring good news and who publish glad tidings. This is the gospel. This is Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17. I have proclaimed glad tidings. That's the goodness of the righteousness, God's righteousness. In the great congregation, this is what we talk about with each other. We talk about God's righteousness, what he has secured and accomplished for us. He has given us his righteousness, and we are to proclaim those glad tidings in the congregation. We don't just get together to have cinnamon rolls and coffee. We get together to talk about the beauty of God's grace. What has he done for us? We remind each other. In the midst of the congregation, wherever it is, two or three or a multitude, we proclaim the goodness. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, he says. O oh Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, you know it. And we should be able to say that to the Lord. O oh Lord, you know it. I have not refrained. Just like Christ, he proclaims the righteousness of God. We proclaim Christ's righteousness, which has been given to us. We will not restrain our lips. We talk about this. We shouldn't have to be afraid to talk about Christ's righteousness. Not our righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. Psalm 40, verse 10. I have not hidden your righteousness in my heart. This isn't just a singular, individualistic, narcissistic issue. This is devoted to the body of Christ at large. We know what he's done for our soul, and we proclaim it, Philemon, 
right? That the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing done in you in Christ Jesus. That is, in Christ, he has made to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Wisdom and righteousness. That's he has become that to us. Christ has. So we don't hide that. We proclaim what he's done. It doesn't matter. We proclaim it to the congregation. First of all, we say it among each other. We talk about God's righteousness. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. That is the chief goal. Chief goal. Psalm 145. We speak about God's power. We speak about his kingdom. And here, obvious, obviously, of his faithfulness, his salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness. I have not hidden it. I have not suppressed it. Some people dwell in circles where they feel like they have to suppress these beautiful things in our hearts. We shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to suppress what God has done for us. We shouldn't have to suppress Christ's righteousness and God's loving kindness. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. Again, this is the context of God's people. Psalm 40 verse 10. In Psalm 107, we read, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. Let what? Them. Plural. When they get together, that's what we do. We give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men, specifically in context, the wonders of salvation and his righteousness. Let them extol him also where? In the congregation of the people, if you've isolated yourself, you cannot talk about these things. We should be making efforts and inroads into any kind of Christian congregation so that we can talk about these people of like faith and practice. And if you say, well, I don't know that they practice the same things. Well, don't make a judgment of their heart. Get to the nearest fellowship and see if they want to talk about those things. Find people who want to talk about these things. If that means they are learning from you in their little Bible study and maybe they don't know about it, well, stick around. Talk about it. And if they say you're not welcome, okay, don't go back. Don't, Don't go back and cause needless division. If they say you're not welcome, move on to another Bible study. Find people who want to talk about the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. That's not religious. That's just you exercising gratitude, expressing gratitude. To talk about the Lord is to be thankful to the Lord. You're telling the Lord, thank you, and you are expressing that gratitude for what he's done, his wonders, his loving kindness. Let them extol him. We don't talk about ourselves. We don't talk about our social justice. We don't talk about how many people we've baptized. We talk about him. Let us extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders, wherever it is. Again, in an elders meeting, in the congregation, in a youth group, in a children's Bible study, in a women's Bible study, in a musician's Bible study, it does not matter. In a New Beginnings Bible study, in a Celebrate Recovery study, we talk about the Lord. It is not about modern popular psychological concepts. We talk about the Lord and what he has done. Those are the things that produce change. It produces change, not necessarily in our actions, but but though at times there too, but primarily in our thinking toward God and toward one another. The change is we become more loving the more we talk about God's grace and salvation. We become more forgiving, more merciful the more we talk about God's mercy that he has had upon us. That's the change. Read it, Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. By affirming these things, he says constantly, and he talked about the fact that he gave us his righteousness, not according to our righteousness, but according to his grace and mercy. Praise the Lord, Psalm 149. Sing to the Lord a new song, and what? His praise in the congregation. In the congregation of what? Godly ones. How are we godly? By our works? No. By his righteousness. That's how we're godly. We are perfect, heavenly, godly. Why? Because of our works? No. An emphatic no. It is simply because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. 
He has finished the work for us and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. That's how he sees us. So that's what we talk about. When we sing, we're singing a new song, the song of the Lamb, of what he has done. And we do it in the congregation of the godly ones. So again, we've looked at the text. We've looked at the context and and the inner text, a little bit of the inner text with Psalms. So now let's look at the inner text in Hebrews. Let's see what the New Testament actually has to say about this uh, issue of fellowship. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. Now, it's very interesting. I'll talk to preterists who use this passage to defend isolation because they say, well, they were looking for that day. No, 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 no. We do not look at urgent warnings to exclude general commandments. For example, Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Be watchful, therefore, and sober unto prayer. Does that mean we're no longer watchful, no longer sober, no longer pray just because the end of the Jewish system and temple already came? No, of course not. That makes no sense. We are talking about things that are beneficial to the body of Christ. So here he says, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some. He says it's a bad habit, but encouraging one another. That word encouraging is, is, is exhorting. It's the Greek word parakaleo or paraklete. It's where we get the word paraklete, parakletos. That's what the comforter is. Jesus said, I would send you a comforter to those first century saints, those first century believers. And he would comfort them until Christ would come and indwell their heart. Well, now Christ has indwelled our hearts and we need to practice the same thing. Encouraging one another and all the more just as you see the day drawing near. So he's saying, as you see this day getting closer, this day what? When God would destroy the temple and when Jesus would be dwelling in their hearts, so much more as you see it drawing near. Not just because, oh, we're seeing, we're about to see a building get destroyed, the temple. But no, but also so much more as Christ, according to Ephesians, would dwell in their hearts by faith. That is significant. How much more should we come and exhort one another? Come beside one another. Parakletos, it means literally uh, uh, a, a side called a side, called to the side of someone. We're called to the sides of each other to minister to one another, to remind us Jesus is here. We'll look in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they were continually, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' Teaching, there's that word doctrine, to the apostles' doctrine, teaching, and what? Koinonia, fellowship, communion, koinonia, that's what that word means, the company becoming one. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, how does that work with Proverbs 18, verse 1? He who separates himself, what? Seeks his own desire. He or she I've seen a lot of women do this too. They separate and it's selfishness. We've got to avoid this. We've got to be, we need each other. I'm telling you right now, I was as selfish as can be from 04 to 07 when I went through a really dark time. Very, very dark time. I just isolated. I isolated me and I isolated my family and it took its toll. We're fighting against sound wisdom. Sound wisdom. And if we read Proverbs carefully, it's very interesting. Wisdom is often presented as Jesus. Proverbs chapter 8 compared with chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians. The Bible says Jesus is made unto us wisdom. The Bible says Christ is the power and wisdom of God. You quarrel against. You quarrel against Christ when you separate yourself. You're quarreling against Christ. You're quarreling against his body. When you separate, the body needs you. The body needs, not just you that needs the body. The body needs you. We're feet, we're hands, we're mouths, we're noses, we're ears, we're knees, we're toes, we're calves, we're femurs, (laughs) right? We're elbows, ligaments, biceps, traps. Latissimus dorsi. We're all these parts of the body and we need each other. They continually 
were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread. They ate together. This isn't just talking about Mass or the Eucharist or communion. This is talking about eating together. We eat together. We talk together. We find those people who are willing to talk about the Lord. We don't want to get legalistic about it. We want to be regular about it. It still happens. I've been studying the Bible for years. And when fellowship suddenly dwindles, well, man, what's going on right now with this corona thing, this COVID-19? I mean, it's a sad thing. And I don't really have an explanation. You know, the law is telling us don't meet together. The Bible says do not forsake. Well, we've got Zoom. What are we to do? That's a hard one. I don't want people to get sick. Yet the Bible tells us to fellowship. You know, I don't want to be the one who, who uh, you know, is, is held accountable for, you know, we've seen it in the news about some of these churches. Well, they, they met together and a bunch of them got sick, okay? We're here in our household. We're trying to practice the six-foot rule. Well, couldn't we do that? Couldn't we just practice the six-foot rule in fellowship? It's a tough issue. I don't want to be dogmatic. I want to be careful. I want to be respectful of people. We certainly don't want to go around coughing on people. But it said that they prayed together, continually devoting themselves. Now listen, this is a rare thing what's going on with COVID. It's very rare. But don't don't make a practice out of this if it is sort of forcing us to stay home, stay at home. There's a lot of political discussion in this right now. A lot of political discussion. Where are our rights? Well, listen, I know you may worship the Constitution. Don't. Worship the Lord Jesus and study the scriptures. Far more truth there. The Constitution is not infallible. Okay, there are going to be a lot of errors. The Communist Manifesto is not infallible. A lot of errors. Are there some truths in the Constitution? Sure, some biblical truths. Are there some truths in the Communist Manifesto? Sure. Are there some truths in the Book of Mormonism? Sure, but they are fallible. They are fallible. We go to the scriptures, to Christ himself, who has given us the message of the gospel. You can find bits of truth at the grocery store. You can find it in a tract. You could find it in Buddhism and Hinduism. But Christ is the only way. And the scriptures are what we, by faith, look to for all things pertaining to life and godliness. Day by day, It says in Acts, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness. That's the eating that we're talking about. That's the fellowship. House to house. Isn't that beautiful? In the temple. So that that might have been a big congregational meeting on Sundays, but then house to house. Who knows throughout the week or on Sundays? There's no hard and fast rule. It's just we need each other. We need regular fellowship. I'd much rather have a a house-to-house meeting of three or four or five people on a regular basis than just this once-a-week Sunday thing where you're just an anonymous figure who goes in and out. With sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. What a wonderful spirit we see demonstrated in Acts chapter 2. Verse 42 through 47. Read it. It's a beautiful passage. In Acts chapter 5, And every day in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching what? Jesus as the Christ. That's what they talked about in their fellowship. They talked about it. It meant a ton to them. It should mean a ton to us. We don't separate ourselves. Now these, speaking of the Bereans in Acts, later on in Acts, look what it says about them. These were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Well, now why did he have to go out of his way to point that out? How were they more noble? For they, what? Received the word with great eagerness. So it was a mindset toward the word of God. It was a mindset toward the gospel, examining the scriptures daily. So the word and the scriptures, synonymous there. Christ and the scriptures, synonymous. 
They received it with great eagerness. It wasn't like, oh, I got to go to a Bible study. It was they were excited about it. They were zealous about studying the scriptures to find out what? To see whether these things were so. What things? Whether Jesus was the Messiah, the fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy, the one who would remove sin and establish his kingdom in the hearts of his people. As Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. They wanted to find out whether those things were true. Now watch this. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, encourage one another day after day. So that's that same Greek word, exhort one another. Of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, here he uses the same Greek word, parakletos or, or, or paraclete. Encourage one another, come beside one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, lest any one of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And really, honestly, that's what took place in my life when I separated, when I separated from the people of God. I became very cynical, very hardened. Don't do that. Don't just sit behind your computer screen and think you've got all your ducks in a row. I'm, I'm one of these guys that look, to the best of our ability, if for whatever reason we are kept from fellowship, we should try our best. They've got different programs. We do have Facebook, but it is no substitute for body-to-body -body communion, getting in the presence of someone, feeling their vibrations. You say, what? Yes, their warmth, their smiles, as they shift, as they speak. We're together. We're praying. It's a different vibe than just a bunch of people on a computer screen like Zoom. Zoom is wonderful. I thank God for it. It's really neat. Substitute for real in-person fellowship? I don't think so. I don't believe so. Not after what I see in the scriptures. I mean, you break bread together. That's a part of it. Again, we're in a weird circumstance with COVID. Then when he had come, Acts chapter 11, and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to what? Encourage. There's the same Greek word. To exhort them, come beside them with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Let's go back to the first one. This one we saw in Acts. It says they received the word with great eagerness. Now let's look. He rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart, great eagerness, resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. How do you do that? Getting together and studying the scriptures. Getting together and finding out what merciful Jesus has to say to our soul about what he has done for us. I will declare, as the psalmist says, what great things he has done for my soul. So that's Proverbs 18. It, it, it's meddling against all sound wisdom. It's quarreling against sound wisdom. When we isolate, we're called to fellowship and talk about God's salvation, God's loving kindness, God's mercy. And uh, I encourage you to do that as much as you can. Again, interesting times. Um, pray about these things. I want to thank you for joining me in this study. Please feel free to support us. If you look down at the lower right-hand corner, patreon.com in CMI Live. Uh, you can support us and support this ministry. Uh, our conference has been canceled due to COVID and, and a lot of people being out of work. We encourage you to pray for the brothers and sisters who are out of work and who are losing, you know, who have lost their jobs or who are losing their businesses. Huge trying times. Um, we should devote ourselves to praying for them and if at all possible, reaching out to them and helping support the brothers and sisters in Christ. Do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. I love you lots and God bless you as you continue to pursue fellowship, the body of Christ, and giving God thanks for the great things he's done for our souls.